Okay, um, uh, okay, we continue. Uh, we continue a sketch of the proof of this the judge's method. And let me recall you that the point was that you start from a, a weak solution, which is only W12, so an energy solution to this uniformly elliptic equation, where the main point that I wanted to stress here is that these coefficients are only measurable. And uh, nevertheless, you can come up with the local Hilbert continuity of the solution with a um, um, with an exponent that uh, strongly depends on the only on the only on on the only qualitative information you have on the matrix. That's the ratio between the two eigenvalues. That is the thing that makes it uniformly elliptic. In general, when this ratio goes to plus infinity, so when you lose ellipticity, when you start losing ellipticity, so uh, this goes to zero when this ratio goes to plus infinity. And in particular, this has been uh, shown uh, by, in a counterexample by Piccini and, Sp and uh, Spagnolo, if I remember correctly, at the beginning of the 70s. This was the judge's school. Um, okay, yesterday, so uh, the main point, as I told you, is that we want to commute something which has a, a distributional and actual measure theoretic uh, sense, that is a W12 function, in, in a function which is pointwise defined and actually other continuous. So the first thing that resembles us, the properties of harmonic functions, and remember that when A of A, uh, when A of X, uh, AX, uh, it's, um, it's a diagonal matrix with constant coefficients, this is a actually a harmonic function. Well, this is the L, L2 L infinity estimate. And you see, you, you start seeing the way that uh, an information in average uh, is transformed into a pointwise uniform information. And now we go, we want to go to the straight uh, um, um, approach. So uh, the point is that on one side we have uh, measure, measure theoretic in a way solution. And then we want to commute this into a uni uh, to a solution which is pointwise defined everywhere, so to a continuous solution. And now we go into the world of the Georgi density conditions. Okay, uh, uh, the Georgi density conditions are conditions on the density of level sets that are transformed into uh, everywhere conditions. So now you really see at a microscopical level the transition between a measure theoretic approach, a measure theoretic information, to an everywhere information. So density of level sets, of level sets, it's commuted into an everywhere information. On level sets. So, and this goes via two lemmas, and uh, let me present you um, the first of the two lemmas. So, the proof of elder continuity splits into two lemmas, and um, uh, you see, this approach, it, I mean, if you go to textbooks, uh, very few textbooks present this, uh, this approach, uh, but if you look, for instance, at the Benedictus, textbook, uh, it's a general textbook, uh, then you can find this approach, which is really the real approach, because then this opens the way to a, a real philosophical approach, that is, you want to commute and prove pointwise inequalities using density informations. Density informations, and actually, um, it is a... Um, um, because, uh, actually, you very often see these kinds of things in... Uh, via pointwise and uh, integral estimates. Now we go to real density conditions. So the first lemma of the Georgi, the first lemma of the Georgi is the following one. Okay, from now on, let me take a ball. All the balls will, will be concentric, okay? So, for instance, a ball centered at zero after translation has no point. We take, uh, uh, we define the oscillation over a ball of radius 2 rho as the soup over B2 rho of U minus, 
the inf of a b two rho of a, of a, of your function. And now you see you're using the function that u is uh, uh, u is bounded. Why? Because now you can define this. These quantities are well defined. Okay. Okay. In particular, let me call it omega. And in particular, let me call you uh, mu this quantity. Uh, mu minus this quantity. Okay. And then I want to go to what happens in uh, B row. And the first lemma is the following one. Lemma one. Okay. Um, the lemma one tells you that uh, for every epsilon between zero and one, the following thing happens uniformly. Um, it happens uniformly the following. For every sigma between 0 and 1, there exists a mu, depending on uh, sigma and the data, that is uh, L over mu and N, in 0, 1, such that if the density of this set in the ball zero is small so if the density of the level set where u approaches its maximum you see this is the oscillation okay take for instance uh, assume that uh, u is positive and the oscillation is equal to 1 okay This is B rho. This is the maximum. If the measure of the level sets u minus epsilon in this condition is small, okay, so you're measuring uh, the ratio, the portion where u exceeds this quantity. Then it happens that u is always larger than mu plus minus epsilon sigma omega in b rho half. So this means that something which has a small density disappears on the next scale. So if this is b rho, you take b rho half, you enlarge, let's say you enlarge, And this is u minus sigma epsilon. And you see that in B row, the function is always less than u minus sigma epsilon. You see? So something which is small at one scale, as small density at one scale, disappears on the next scale if you enlarge a bit this. So this is the judge's first lemma. It's a very deep fact if you if you believe, if you if you think. This tells you that there's a sort of hidden maximum principle that acts directly at the level of a density. And so this commutes a measure theoretic information at a micro local level into an everywhere information. So this is the judge's first density lemma. So you see, when I start looking at beat b rho, then I see very little of this set at this level. I see this, 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 this. If I go to the next scale and I enlarge the level, then the function is always smaller than this level. So what is the, what is the outcome? Is that if before here the oscillation was 1, here will be 1 minus sigma minus epsilon. So you start reducing the oscillations. And now if you think that if you pass from one scale to another scale and you reduce the oscillations, then you will pass to another scale, to another scale, to another scale, and you will always reduce in a quantitatively defined manner, and this will lead to elder continuity. And you see that conditions of this type have, have been very much used by 
for, for instance, in the theory of preboundary problems, in several other theories, uh, by Caffarelli, for instance, uh, and also by Benedetto in the approach of parabolic TDEs, and are, are pervasive. I mean, but they really go back to this, to this observation, because the original point of the judge's theory is that you commute a measure theoretic information into an everywhere information. And if you, if you think that you could combine this, for instance, with exit, exit time argument, you see immediately the power of these methods uh, when, you, you, when you plug in with, for instance, Calder and Sigmund methods and so forth. And of course, if you can do something from above, you can do something from below. And the, and the counterpart is that uh, in the same way, if u is less than or equal than mu minus plus epsilon omega, and uh, if this is small, then this implies that u is above minus plus epsilon sigma omega. So you can do from above. What you can do from above, you can do from below by simply doing this. So that's essentially this is the approach for super solution, and that's the approach for sub solution. That's the approach for super solution, and that's the approach for uh, sub solutions. Whenever you see an estimate from below, it's what, what is this? What, what are you saying? Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, thanks. So, exactly. Sorry. So, if this is small, then in the next scale, it disappears. So that's the philosophy. Something which is small in density, it disappears on the next scale, provided you tilt a bit. And once again, if you if you do this from below, this is the this is what you're doing. If this is if this is uh, let's say minus one, if this is the minimum, then if this is uh, minus one plus something, then if this do this, if it's small. Then you reduce a bit, and here it will be smaller, larger, and larger. So that's the first lemma. The first lemma is still based on an iteration similar to the one you show you saw before, you saw yesterday, and it's it's based on the use of once again Sobolev embedding theorem, more isoparametric inequality equivalently, if you like. So let me just keep the first lemma. Of course, there is one point in this lemma. You want to use this lemma. So you, you have to know that as soon you approach that as soon you approach the maximum, so you, you enlarge this, right? Then these sets are are getting smaller and smaller. Otherwise you'll never be able to do it. Okay? That's the content of the second lemma of the Georgia. The second lemma, and eventually the combination of the two lemmas will give the Hilbert continuity as I, as I will show you. Well, the second lemma tells the following. The second lemma tells you exactly that this is happening. Okay, that this is happening. Lemma two. So the second lemma is the following one. Assume that the set where u is less than or equal than mu plus minus omega two over B rho, it's larger than theta. So assume that there is a portion where mu is uh, below the maximum, well below the maximum. Okay. So assume that this happens for you don't know how, but it happens for some little while. Okay. Then for every sigma, for every new, sorry. There exists epsilon depending on u and the data that is n l over u but n zero one such that the density of the set where mu plus minus omega b rho over b rho is less than sigma is less than u. So actually, you are saying now the following. You're saying if there's a, if there is a, some part of the function which is below 
then when you get close to the maximum, you go, you go to zero. Actually, if you want to know the dependence, uh, the dependence is the following one. Whenever, you, when, when, whenever this goes polynomially to zero, this goes geometrically to zero. For instance, if this is something one over n, this epsilon should be um, one over two n or the like, or a certain power. So it goes geometrically. It goes geometrically. This is the content of the so-called logarithmic estimate. And this is linked to the, to the conjecture you were telling yesterday. So, so for equations that Georgie was imaging, there was a polynomial dependence, not geometric. So you see, it's a kind of shifting between, uh, in, in, it's a classical in ellipticity. If you shift a property from one point, as this has consequences. If you decrease L infinity to exponential, then you have to compensate this, and you have to compensate to drop an exponential. Okay, so you see, the first lemma tells you that you can reduce the oscillation provided the density is small, while the second lemma shows you that the density is small in a quantitative way. And now the combination of the two allows to, and the combination and the iteration of the two allows to prove the Hilder continuity. Proof of this is so, can also be obtained uh, for equations uh, by the logarithmic lemma of Moser. And uh, Let me tell you that, uh, um, let, me let, me, let me now tell you briefly how to, to combine the two, although now this can be easily imagined. Okay, ah, of course, no need to say that if you can do this from below, from above, you can do this from below. You can do this from below, saying that, uh, that the following happens, of course. Now, if there's a, there's a, there's a portion of the set now if, if it happens that you are not always too close to the minimum then when you approach the minimum you decrease the density so this means that for every new larger than zero one there exists epsilon depending essentially on n mu and oh sorry I should have not called this the second new I mean this is a variable well, let me call let me call the ratio between electricity like this. Okay? Between zero and one, such that the density of the set where this is less than mu plus epsilon omega intersected B rho over B rho, it's less than. So whatever it happens from above, it happens. From, it has to happen from below. This is very simple to understand why, because if u solves the equation, then minus u solves the equation, right? And then uh, you can uh, you can exchange the things. Equivalently, if uh, u is a super solution, minus u is a sub solution, and blah blah. That's the same point. So the point is that uh, really you keep in mind this density, this, this deep density effect. If something is small in density, then it happens to disappear at the next scale. So this is the, the this is the power of smoothing in ellipticity, right? Ellipticity is diffusion, so it smooths out the singularity whenever you go to smaller scale. Something that happens on one scale, it improves at the next scale. This is the general phenomenon of ellipticity and regularization in ellipticity. Something which is okay on one scale, it's super okay on the next scale. And that's a quantitative way we will see that this doesn't happen in the vectorial case. In the vectorial case, singularity still occur, so there's only a weak version of this, in a sense that in order to, to, uh, in order to realize the formation of singularities, you have to have a substantial quantity of, uh, of energy spent by the singularity. Below this energy threshold, then the ellipticity smooths out the singularity. So now we will see how to combine the two lemma, so that's lemma two, and that's lemma one. Okay. Um, okay. So, in order to combine the two lemmas, um, we first take sigma equal to one half, 
And therefore, if we fix sigma in one half, then uh, since this happens uniformly with respect to epsilon, then you're fixing mu here. Right? So you're fixing fix mu that depends on sigma. But sigma is now determined, so mu depends only on the, on the on the n and on the data. The data is the ellipticity ratio. So mu is a universal quantity. So u is universal. And you see it's universal in the sense that it does not even depend on the solution. It depends just on the data. That's another fact that you should keep in mind in regularity. All the estimates are independent of solutions. All the estimates just depend on the information you have on the ellipticity of the problem. Therefore, the ratio between the two eigenvalues that determines the rate of uniform ellipticity of the, of the equation and the dimension. Okay, now you have fixed mu in lemma 1. Therefore, you go to lemma 2, and with this mu, you determine epsilon. So this in turn, epsilon, but epsilon is depending on mu. And mu is universal. So mu epsilon is universal. That is, depends just on n and on the data. It's universal. And the magic fact is that this is independent of epsilon. This is independent of epsilon. Okay. Now, observe, observe that B rho, if you look at B rho, this is included in the set where u, it's, uh, obviously. Why? Because if there's a point which is not even here, not here, then you would have, uh, for this point that does not belong here, you would have ux, and then u would be larger than u plus, plus omega half, less than u minus, plus omega half, and then you would get u plus, minus u minus, less than or equal than 2, but this is uh, omega, so omega is less than or equal than itself, it's not possible. On the other hand, since the measure of this is larger than 1 half, and the measure of larger than 1 half, then this means that, uh, uh, okay, th okay, what does it mean? That with theta equals to one half, then one of these has to happen. Okay, one of these has to happen. So we are able to use to verify the assumption of uh, of uh, of uh, lemma two. We are. Huh? I am sorry. Thanks a lot. Otherwise, it would have been a disaster. I mean, this this would have been completely trivial actually. Okay, so um, so we can apply lemma 2, and if we apply lemma 2, then one of the two things has to happen. Let's say that the first is happening, otherwise you tilt and you go to the second one, okay? So if this happens, then this happens. So this means that the rate, the density of this set is very small. But if this density is very small, Lemma 1 tells you that on the next scale, this is less than or equal than this. Okay, so this means that u, it's uh, less than or equal than mu plus minus epsilon omega over 2. Okay, on the other end, the, the infimum, it's, uh, okay, oh, oh, on the other hand, if you pass to a smaller scale, the infimum can only increase, so mu is still larger than this guy. Right? And um, so what happens is that if you look at the oscillation on the rate, b rho over 2, this is less than or equal than, uh, than what? This is less than or equal than... Uh, uh, then mu plus minus this minus mu minus minus this so it's less than or equal than omega 2 rho because it's mu minus minus 
two plus minus sigma half over two. Because you have uh, 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 sorry, epsilon. And this is less than or equal than uh, 1 minus epsilon over 2 rho to rho, if I remember correctly, and uh, this is 2 rho. Probably there could be some, I mean, some, some something smaller because, I mean, if this is less than or equal than mu plus uh, minus, so it's uh, 1 minus, uh, yeah, it's correct. Because you see, the, the infimum stays the same and you decrease the maximum. So the oscillations has decreased of a factor which is now universal. Why? Because you see where you determine epsilon. You fix theta equals to one half. Right? Then you determine the mu, which is universal. Mu determines epsilon. Now, epsilon is becoming universal, and this works uniformly with sigma equal to 1 half. Okay, so what is the, the outcome? Is that you have reduced the oscillation of a function from a ball to b to rho to b rho half of a fixed quantity. So the oscillation has decreased of a fixed quantity. And of course, this is independent of the ball you are starting with. So if you start with a the ball, then on the next scale, you, you can do, the, you can do the, the usual thing. So you can iterate the whole, the whole scheme. So let's, let's see how you iterate the whole scheme. In order to iterate, and you see how, how delicate the thing is. This is a typical fact in regularity. You have to keep track of the dependence of the constant. Everything must be made quantitatively precise, because otherwise the constants will blow up in your hands. That's very typically common. So these are this is the opposite of the uh, of the passage to the limit arguments. In the in the passage to the limit, things disappear, and you don't mind the rate at which they are disappearing. Here, everything must be quantitative at every time, and, uh, and you have to. I mean, you have to take attention. You have to really pay attention to this because otherwise uh, it's very often the case that you end up with a vicious cycle and, and the constants are not under control. So if you want to iterate, you start with a ball. We start with a fixed ball. Then we take um, uh, these balls called uh, R4 to the N, right? And we know that rho N plus 1 is decaying like this. Therefore, after several iterations, you'll get that rho to the n is less than or equal than eta to the n rho to the r. Okay? So you are iterating for every n. So in other words, uh, 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 every time you shrink the ball, the, the oscillations decay of a fixed factor. And now it's very easy to see because take rho, which is less than rho, than capital R. Uh, so take uh, take uh, a k, which is uh, doing the following, which is doing the following. And um, this means that uh, rho over r is um, for k plus. And uh, at this stage, if you write down, if you do the usual thing, that is, you're writing down, if you if you take k over rho, if you get k from here and you plug it in here. You get uh, you get that uh, rho is less than or equal than rho to the alpha, and you get rho where um, alpha is uh, log of eta over log 
or four. I think it's not very difficult to to see that from this information you can take uh, you can get uh, you can get k from here in terms of rho over or r and then therefore you get this and so this is precisely the Hilder continuity of a solution even with an a priori estimate so Hilder continuity is the more you shrink the more you decay with a fixed rate so Hilder continuity is decaying with a fixed rate okay so you see, and this is, a, we are really at the core of the judge's argument. So it's a density, it's the combination of these two density level sets. So the, the second lemma tells you that uh, if you approach the maximum, if you approach the maximum, imagine that epsilon is going to zero. If you approach the maximum, this is going to, to be zero. Okay? But if this is small, then on the next scale you disappear, and that's it. Okay, this is the very basic argument, and uh, there are now many variants of this basic argument. So let me let me give you now a brief a brief survey of all the variants. So as I told you yesterday, uh, everything here is not really depending on the fact that uh, that U is a solution, but rather on the fact that U is is in a Georgi class. So it satisfies this two Cacciopoli type inequalities on level sets. Okay. So there are several ways. There are several ways uh, to belong to a De Georgi's class with transition. And now let me let me give you the following. The following list of uh, of results that still hold. That still hold. That still hold for these solutions. But the important fact you have to keep in mind is that you have seen how to commute a measure theoretic information to an everywhere information. And you have seen it uh, uh, at uh, real microlocal level. So you analyze precisely the decay of the level set, and then an information in density turns into an, an everywhere information. This is really the atomic uh, formulation of the general principle that when you solve an elliptic equation, uh, then things that happen in average uh, eventually happen uniformly. Okay, this is the, really the, the, the fact. Okay, so first thing, take for instance a solution to equations like this. And um, now you prescribe that monotonicity is satisfied in the following way. Of x u z t minus one, and you can eventually say lower order terms, lower order terms, and um, and then u this is u r, so some alpha that depends on the data that is L and u. Why? Because you can easily see, as yesterday, that these are uh, uh, that these are, uh, let's say, solutions to um, um, uh, that uh, that these solutions satisfy the Cacciopoli type inequality as you saw yesterday. The proof is eventually the same, and there is no difference between p different and two. Of course, here it's p is supposed to be larger than. So now we go to the calculus of variations, and let me make some. Let me point to some famous extensions by Jacquin and Giusti. Um, and um, at the beginning of the of the nineties, at the beginning of the eighties, and the Jacquin and Giusti, they do consider integral functionals of the following type: f w dw dx. Okay, so you take a minimizer, and uh, the, the the point is that Jaguint and Just the only they do consider this kind of growth conditions, uh, z, l, z to the p, plus terms less than or equal than z to the p, plus terms. In particular, 
here no notion of convexity is required. So in particular, if you want to apply direct methods to these functionals, a priori you cannot, because all talk or is satisfied, and then uh, eventually you go to you, you go to, uh, to verify convexity, which is not satisfied here, because you only have growth conditions. And this was uh, an old conjecture of the judge, a conjecture of the judge that minimizes are still regular. In particular, you see, you cannot use the euler Lagrange equation of the functional, first of all, because the functional is not supposed to be convex, but especially because it doesn't exist, because there is no differentiability with respect to W variable. Nevertheless, U is C0 alpha for some alpha depending once again on the data. Furthermore, the concept, uh, the concept extends to the so-called quasi-minima. And quasi-minima is something that fails to be minimized uh, for a constant. Okay, a quasi-minimizer of this functional, if we call this functional f of capital U omega, then quasi minimizer, it's something which is uh, that satisfies this. For Q larger than one. Of course, there is a minimizer satisfy this for Q equals to one. But pay attention that uh, here, the trick is that you have to allow to be to have the support both here and here. That's what you get when you satisfy the integral conditions of minimality. Otherwise, you go to spherical uh, and this is, uh, once again, this quasi-minimizes u is C0 alpha for some alpha. This doesn't happen for the, for the, this doesn't happen for the, for the notion of the spherical quasi-minimizer, and the spherical quasi-minimizer is that uh, spherical is that when this happens, for every, ta every time that the support of u minus w is included, then it can be with. So this is not true, not true. There's still one notion for which this is true and that relies on the judge's idea. Idea is that's the notion of omega minimizer. Omega minimizer. And this means that uh, you are satisfying this zero, less than or equal than f of w zero. Well, omega rho goes to zero. One goes to zero. So uh, the more and more you shrink, the more and more you shrink, the more and more you approach the real concept of minimality. And these are still through your C zero. Okay, this has, uh, uh, these are basic consequences of the judge's uh, uh, theory for the Hilder continuity of minimizers. Uh, okay, let me briefly say what happens for the gradient. For the gradient, it happens nothing but uh, something which is called higher integrability. So what about, what about the U? So, um, then, what well, it can be proved, and this is also holds. This also holds in the vectorial case. So this, it's a certain sense uh, what it remains from this theory when you pass to the vectorial case. So sorry, capital N following the notation I established in the, on the first day. Um, then the U, which is supposed to be under these conditions in LP lock. So. I will omit to denote lock. Everything will be local because all the estimates I'm talking about are local in nature as long as I'm not claiming results up to the boundary. Um, so you start from a functional here which is naturally defined in W1P 
So therefore, you come up with a gradient which is in LP, and that is, uh, you can prove that there exists Q larger than P such that DU belongs to LQ log. This is the so-called higher integral theory. And this also holds under uh, the assumptions of measurable coefficients. So under the assumption of measurable coefficients, you can prove everything you like for U concerning the Helder continuity, but for the gradient, nothing about the oscillations. That's the only thing remaining. That's the only thing remaining. Okay, this is, uh, this is based on something which is uh, important to, to recall here because it's a general tool you should keep in your toolbox uh, and it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's the self-improving property, self-improving property of uh, reversal during inequalities. of reverse Hilder inequalities. Uh, the self-improving property of reverse Hilder inequalities uh, is the following one. Assume you have a function f of, let me call it g, that satisfies the following, uh, the following property. You get g, p, 1 over p, on the b rho half, and it is less than or equal than a constant that g to the gamma dx 1 over gamma. Okay, and this for every ball. Then this implies that actually, so g is actually belonging to LP, and gamma is less than or equal, is less, strictly less than. So you see that if gamma would be larger than p, this would be a trivial consequence of Jensen's inequality. Now you're claiming you're, uh, you're claiming the opposite, paying a price. You switch from the ball to the double ball, increasing the constant that can be as large as you like. So there would exist g, so there exists q larger than p, depending on what? On the only thing you have here, c, such that g belongs to LQ lock. And the following thing actually belongs, commutes, and holds for Q. So it self-improves. So once you have an improvement of the inequality of the integrability in this rigid regime, so you invert the self-improving property, then you get a bit better. So this is a, a so-called open-ended condition. Once you satisfy for a, a positive number, you satisfy it for a bit more. So you never end in, into a closed interval into a closed interval, okay? Um, so, and how do you satisfy this? So, which was the thing you were, so which was the thing you were, um, so which was the thing you were, uh, the only thing you were using to prove the Helder continuity? That was the Cacioppoli type inequality. It's once again the Cacioppoli type inequality, but this time you don't need level sets. So the Cacioppoli type inequality for these kinds of functionals uh, uh, can be obtained as in the paper by Jacquinto and Giusti, so you're not using the equation, okay? And of course, everything I'm telling you is uh, also, hold, also holds, is also valid for solutions. So I'm talking about both solutions and minimizers with a trickier proof for the minimizers. So the Cacioppoli type inequality you get is the following one. You get the rho, b to the p, 1 over p, less than or equal, constant c, u over r to the p. And since, uh, the I mean, since if you subtract a constant to u, then this still solves the same function, then you can put the average. And uh, that's the Cacioppoli type in the book. But now what happens? It happens that, uh, it happens the following, it happens the following, that you can, that you can now use the following thing you can do, 1 over p, 1 over p, trivially, and then you can use Poincaré inequality, then gets you, P and the star, 
one of p and the star, and p and the star is the one whose sobol of conjugate is p. So this is p. And uh, what is this? This is a reversal of inequality. So you can apply Gehring's lemma. If you apply Gehring's lemma, then you come up that the u is you know, q for q larger than p, just depending on this constant, but this constant from the proof depends on the data, so the q depends on the data. So that's the only thing you can retain when you pass to, uh, to analyze the gradient thinking. It's invariant between the scalar and the vectorial case. Okay, so this is the this is what I'm, this is what I, uh, what ends up the theory for measurable coefficients. Now we go to higher order theory and we want to analyze the gradient continuity. Now let me start from the most famous example and let me recall you that I'm now always talking about the scalar case. Um, so you see, both the gradient higher integrability and uh, the local order continuity of the solution uh, are consequence of the basic tool, that is the Cacciopoli type inequality, which is the only tool uh, at your disposal because coefficients are measurable. As long as coefficients are measurable, you cannot do anything else. And especially uh, with, the, with the case dealing with the, uh, with the um, quasi-minimizer where you only have growth conditions even not convexity assumption. That's, uh, the proof is not very difficult, but if you think of the result that was originally conjectured by the judge, then you see that it's really non-trivial. Imagine that at that time everything was done using equations and convexity and ellipticity, now you suddenly only use growth conditions. And the thing is rather simple to understand. Why? Because ellipticity is bound uh, uh, to describe the behavior of the second variation of the functional, so of the second derivatives. And if you control the second derivatives, you are controlling the regularity of the gradient. But when you look for Hilder continuity, you're not looking to the regularity at the, at the regularity of the gradient. You're looking so at the oscillations of the gradient. You're looking at the oscillations of u. So these are controlled by the gradient. But the function controls the gradient via coercivity. So you don't need convexity. So convexity controls second derivatives. Second derivatives control the oscillations of the gradient. And that's what you need to prove the oscillations of the gradient at grades. But if you want to restrict yourself to the oscillations of u, then the oscillations of u, uh, in, um, in the, in a dimensionally speaking, are controlled by the gradient itself. And the coercivity rather than the convexity controls the growth of the gradient and therefore the oscillations of u. That's why the whole theory works as such only using Kachopoli type inequality. That's the major fact. Um, But now we go to the higher regularity of the gradient. And if we go to the higher regularity of the gradient, uh, if we go to the higher regularity of the gradient, um, let me start from the prototype of functional I'm going to consider. And um, the two types of functionals are the following one. This one and this one. So you, from the point of view of the growth conditions, there's no difference. Both of them are growing as p at infinity, but the, the difference occurs when you analyze the, the second derivatives. And uh, this gives an order Lagrange equation, which is the following one. Well, this one gives rise to this. Difference, this is degenerate, this is not. When the u goes to zero, and for instance p is larger than two, then the, the, the largest eigenvalues goes to zero. Well, this is not the case. Look, both of them are uniformly elliptic. Because the ratio between the, the eigenvalue, you see these are quasi-diagonal structures, so it's constant. But this is degenerate or singular when p is less than two, this is not. Okay, in both cases, you'll get, in both cases, you'll get, uh, uh, you get uh, the, the Hilder continuity of the gradient. As an effect of degeneracy, here you will get C0, C1 alpha regularity, 
In the first case, it's C1 alpha, alpha for some alpha. And this is a famous result due to Nina Wehrzell, although several people attribute this to Ullenbeck, who proved in the vectorial case. This was proved by Nina Wehrzell in a fantastic mathematician in uh, 1967. I remember the first time I met Nina Wehrzell, I was at Mittagleffer Institute in the year 2000, and I was, uh, uh, I was having difficulties in making Xerox copy of something, of a paper, of an old paper, and then uh, uh, this lady I never I never saw before came up to me and uh, she made the copies for me. And then she introduced herself. Oh, I'm Nina Wealtseva. And I said, Oh, the famous one. And then eventually, eventually I remember I was uh, in the in the common room of Nita Gleffler Institute and uh, uh, there was me, Nina, and uh, um, Rashetniak. And Rashetniak recalled. Then in 65, uh, motivated by problems in quasi-conformal mappings, where this functional occurs for the conformal case, P equals to N, uh, he told Nina that uh, he proposed her the problem, and then she solved it with a very new technique. Okay, in this case, it's C1 alpha for some alpha, not for every alpha. The optimal alpha is still an open problem. It is probably a lower bound, it's conjecture to be one-third, looking at the so-called infinity Laplacian, but it's still open. And uh, for sure it's not every alpha, because there are counterexamples given by uh, Nina Wurzelva herself. And um, in the second case you get C1 alpha for every alpha. As an effect by perturbation methods. Eh? No, no, no restriction. P larger than 1, of course. But no restriction. I can tell you that uh, um, you see, the, the regularity here worsens when p is very large. When p goes to 1, it increases more and more. So, in fact, when p is uh, larger, uh, approaches to 1, then you get a better regularity, and even C infinity, not really C infinity, but it, in, in, it increases. You can look at the paper by Ivanietz and Manfredi. On Revista Matematica Iberoamericana, where they, where they take the the the, uh, the P Laplace equation, they rewrite it as a system using the so-called autograph transformation, and then they study the decay of the Fourier coefficients of solutions. It's a very tough paper, very tough computation, but then they come up with uh, some optimal exponents that shows you that when P goes to 1, then the regularity increases, essentially because you gain more and more ellipticity. Because you see, when uh, du is larger, uh, du is bounded. When u is large, there is no problem. When u goes to zero for p less than 2, you gain more ellipticity. So the, the equation gets more and more elliptic. Therefore, you get better regularity. The real difficulties here occur for p being large. Because when p goes, when du can go to zero, and it can go to zero, then you lose ellipticity, so therefore high regularity gets lost. Okay? So that's the point. And, um, and, uh, um, Okay, so um, um, so for uh, anyway for the higher order case, let me let me tell you that uh, that uh, w what is the proof for the higher order case? For instance, for C one alpha for every alpha, it's based on so-called Schauder estimates. Schauder estimates are uh, are before the George's theory, and they tell you that for instance uh, the following happens by perturbation methods. Perturbation methods are those ones that I started by. Uh, telling you how it was difficult to, uh, to, to get results for measurable coefficients. But now, uh, when A of X is better, you can use perturbation methods. So perturbation methods tell you the following. Take a solution of this equation, which is uh, elliptic, bounded coefficients, and now uh, A of X is smoother, in the sense that A of X is continuous. And this implies that U is C0 alpha, but now for every alpha less than 1. Because you can do perturbation. While again, while again, uh, while again, if a of x is uh, c zero beta, and these are then the gradient is exactly in c zero beta. This is Schauder. This is the content of the very classical Schauder estimates. 
Uh, nowadays, there's a, there's a plenty of proofs you can do. You can do yeah, direct methods, you freeze and you compare like Campagnato did, you can do with a fundamental solution, you can do via blow up, via Leon Simon, you can do with plenty of methods, right? But the outcome is that you can do perturbation around something which is linear. So therefore, if you want to get higher regularity for the gradient, and in the non-degenerate case, now you should take a functional f, like this, uh, that satisfies the following growth conditions. Um, f is like c to the p and uh, c to the p modulo constants, but especially these conditions are needed. Uh, these conditions are needed when you look at the second variation of the functional. When you look at the second variation of the functional then uh, this is bounded by uh, mu plus z squared and this is bounded by the same thing here with a big constant, here with a small constant you see the second derivatives they scale as the first one f grows like p as an effect of convexity, the derivative automatically grows as p minus 1, and then you prescribe the growth of the second derivative, which is p minus 2. p minus 2. Okay? And now let me sketch the proof of this, of the second result and how you get every r. Yeah, almost done. I, let me finish the proof and then. And uh, let me finish the proof and, uh, okay. The first thing you prove, you differentiate the equation, you, you use the euler lagrange equation that now can be used. Okay. You differentiate by substituting this with a derivative, and then you get dv, du, dds, u, d phi dx. Okay, now you apply a variant of the Georges technique or Moses iteration technique to prove that du is, uh, is bounded. Okay, now you know that du is bounded. In particular, this becomes a measurable uh, a matrix, which is, uh, this becomes a linear equation in the S, right? Whose coefficients are bounded and measurable. Bounded because now you have these closed conditions and when you plug in the gradient, this is bounded. Measurable because you plug in the gradient. But now the George's theory tells you that du is C0 alpha for some small alpha. Okay? But now this becomes a continuous, okay, of course you have to assume that F is C2, but this goes without saying because we are looking at this function now, so the same But now this becomes what? This becomes an elliptic matrix, and you see mu here, you're using that mu is equal to 1. So that's the ellipticity, so there's no degeneration. So this is uh, 1 plus the minimum of the gradient, that is for 1, if p is larger than 2, otherwise the maximum of the gradient, and this is also bounded. So this, is, this becomes a measurable, uh, a, a, um, an elliptic matrix with continuous coefficients, because f is c2 and the u is continuous, so you combine continuous things. And now you can apply the previous result by perturbation. The perturbation tells you that the solution is in c0 alpha for every alpha, but the solution is the gradient itself. And therefore you come up with this. So, and uh, you see, the George's theory always allows you to do the first step and uh, uh, after which then you go on by perturbation. Let me just tell you that this argument fails for this one. Because in this case mu is equal to zero, and when p is larger than two, and the gradient is zero, then you lose ellipticity, so you cannot apply the George's theory. That's the difficulty between an equation like this, which is non-degenerate, and an equation like this, which is degenerate. And in fact, Nina we also had, had a lot of strength to prove that these uh, solutions are C0 alpha, as eventually Uhlenbeck did uh, 10 years later in the Victoria case. The Peter Plushen theory is essential, 
is essentially a, a theory uh, uh, built up by women. Because it was Nina, we also and Kari Mullen. So this was the fact. I think for today it's okay. Questions? <laughs>